that passage of scripture, uh, I wanted to make sure that y'all saw uh, Ms. Sharon was in Sunday school. Ms. Sharon Turner, where are you, Ms. Sharon? I've been, there you are. I've been whining to everybody about my new glasses. I can't see a thing. So if I call somebody's name, you're going you're gonna to have to do this. But I, I wanted to let y'all know in case you had not seen her, Ms. Sharon was in Sunday school. Say for all of us on the Sunday morning, Ms. Sharon, uh, our covenant with you is, is what we have extended to so many others. We, we are proud to be your family and we love you and, and we are your family and we want to walk with you. And it's so good to see you this morning. Thank you very much for being here. We love you. Acts chapter 4. Same message I preached three years ago. Same message I preached for 
years before that. And I hope, by God's grace, that one day you'll, you'll get a chance to hear me preach it again. So what I'm saying to you is, I, I, I want you to recognize, I hope you hear what I'm saying. I think this message is important. I, I don't generally repeat a lot of messages, but this one, I, I not only am repeating, I want to repeat it. And the reason I want to repeat it is this. I'm not sure all church members understand the significance of deacons. So if you don't hear me say anything else today, I want you to hear this one thing. What I'm going to try and communicate with this message is this. Deacons are a gift from God to the church. Now, did, did you get that? I, I, that's what I want you to get today. I want you to hear me say that deacons are a gift from God to the church. What we're going to learn in this passage and, and in the stories that follow it, it is that deacons were given to the church by God to solve problems. That is the message of the early chapters in the book of Acts. And, and I want to take that story in three quick installments. I, I'm not going to take a lot of time with this, I, but I want you to, to hear what I'm going to say. I want you to track the, the three parts of the message. Now understand first that the early church, right after the resurrection of Christ, right after the day of Pentecost, the early church had a beautiful, a beautiful beginning. The passage we just read says that the early church was unified in spirit, in purpose, and, and, and in a way that we, we can never understand, I think, as Westerners. It, they were even unified in belongings. That they had property in common. They took care of one another in a radical way. And, and the result of this unity was that the gospel of Jesus Christ was being preached with clarity and with power. When a church, you can mark it down, when a church is gathered together and focused for the gospel, the gospel will be preached with clarity and power, regardless of who's doing the preaching. Now this, this picture here at the end of Acts chapter 4, when, if, if we're honest, when we listen description of the early church and in this incredible unity, our, our first thought is probably going to be, man, this sounds too good to last. And it was. The day-to-day -day success and effectiveness of the early church some 2,000 years ago was too good for Satan to leave alone. And so what follows in chapters 5 and 6, don't miss the connection between the end of chapter 4 and the three stories that follow in chapters 5 and 6. What follows in chapters 5 and 6 is nothing less than a three-pronged attack on the church by Satan. This is how Satan responds to a church that is unified and preaching the gospel and ministering to people. You can mark it down. It happens every time. All right, so are you ready? Part one, installment number one, story number one, whatever you want to call it. To this beautiful unity of power and purpose, first there comes an attack in the form of internal corruption. In the first half of chapter 5, we just read the first two verses, but you know the rest of the story. In the first half of chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, two believers, are duped by Satan into thinking that they can introduce lying and fakery and false discipleship into the church. A lot of people claim to be disciples, but they're not really followers of Jesus. So they, they get it in their minds. Satan puts it in their head that they can get away with this. Apparently, they and a lot of other people were so impressed 
by the graciousness of Barnabas. And, 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 and look at what the end of chapter 4 tells us. People were so impressed by him that they quit calling him by his name, Joseph, and they started calling him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Mr. Mr. Encouragement. That's what they started calling him. They quit calling him by his name. They gave him a new nickname. And people were so impressed by what he had done. He had, he had taken maybe his primary home. We, we're not really told. It says that he, that he owned a tract of land. And he sold it. And he brought the money to the apostles. And he said, I, I want you guys to use this to take care of whoever needs to be taken care of. And folks were, were so impressed by that. Everybody thought, man, what a great job. What, what a good thing you've done. And Ananias and Sapphira saw it. And they said, man, I, I wish people talked about us like they talk about Barnabas. So they decided to do the same thing. But they didn't do it with the same spirit. They wanted the same reputation, but they weren't willing to give all of the money. And so they said, oh, yes, this is what we got. They brought the money. And uh, kept part of it. Well, you see where this is going to take the church. This, this is this, this is big change. This is internal corruption. And this is going to radically change the purity and character of the church. So to this threat of corruption, God intervenes in a dramatic and big way. Ananias and Sapphira are gone. The church is protected. Acts chapter 5 verse 11 says, Great fear came on the church. Folks got right. That means there was a revival. Folks straightened up. Problem solved. Installment number two. Corruption has been thwarted, but Satan is not done. The next attack comes in the form of external persecution, not internal corruption, but external persecution. In the second half of chapter 5, the apostles are arrested, thrown in jail, released from jail by an angel, and they go right back to preaching in the temple, and then they are arrested again. And this time brought directly before the Sanhedrin council. This council, the leaders of the Jews, the council threatens them and, and says to them, now, now you guys got to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. Now we, we've had all of that. We want to hear. You, you stop. And in chapter 5, verse 29, the apostles say, uh, well, thanks for the advice, but let me tell you what. Uh, we have to obey God rather than me. So tough. We're going to keep preaching. The Bible says the council became furious. Acts chapter 5 verse 33 says they were ready to execute them on the spot. The council was at the point they said we're, we're done with this problem. We, we're going to can you just imagine Barney 5. Nip it, nip it, nip it in the bud. Except this time God uses kind of an unusual, well, everything God has done has been an unusual intervention. I mean, Ananias and Sapphira say, we can slip one over on the church. God says, no, you can't. The, the council has decided they're going to kill the apostles. God says, watch this. And so what happens in the end of chapter 5 is that God uses a respected member of the council. A man by the name of Gamaliel. Have you ever known one of those guys when he walks in a room, everybody just, just kind of stops and listens to whatever he's going to say? That, that's the kind of guy Gamaliel was. And, and so God uses this respected member of the council, Gamaliel, to argue the others down from killing the apostles. So God rescues his servants through the argument of a lawyer who's not even a believer in Jesus. I mean, that, that breaks at least a cool. Right? 
installment number three. Track three. Here's what we've had. Internal corruption. God stops it. <coughs> External persecution. God stops it. Now, the church comes under the attack of division and distraction in Acts chapter 6. And again, Acts chapter 6 is a story that you know about. But let's talk about how Acts chapter 6 applies to life in the church ever since then. Distraction is one of the toughest enemies that the church has ever faced. Anytime a church gets its vision off of the gospel and onto anything else, it is officially distracted. And once a church gets distracted, it often becomes divided on top of it. And that's exactly what happens in Acts chapter 6. The, and, and, and look, the distraction is not a bad one. Distractions never have to be bad. The, the, the church is simply working in Acts chapter 6 on how they are going to take care of the widows. I mean, that's a good thing, right? Everybody say right. Right? So that, that is a good thing. But when they focus more on how to take care of the widows than the gospel, then the vision they're distracted and then the vision comes. The Greek believers get it in their minds that their widows are not being taken care of as well as the Jewish widows. And so there is a division because, not, not because one group of widows was, we, we don't know if one group of widows was getting better treatment than the other, but they got it in their heads that it was. The problem was not how the widows were being taken care of. The problem was they got their eyes off the gospel. They forgot what they were about. This is where we come to the important place in the story where we have to make the big connection. What have we seen? Satan tried to corrupt the church. God stopped it. Took Ananias and Sapphira out. Satan tried to persecute the church. God stopped it. Use one of the members of the council itself that was going to be the persecuting agent to stop the persecution. And now in chapter 6, Satan is trying to distract and divide the church. What do you think, based on the previous two installments, what do you think God will do? I hope you're thinking, well, it sounds to me like God's going to stop it. And that's exactly what God does. The interesting part of the story is how God stops it. Now, now God's been, got to admit, God's been pretty creative up until this point. Got two church members that are trying to do the flim flam. And what does God do? You're out. You, you, got, a, you got a council of fellows who, who are trying to persecute the church. What's God do? Hey, I'm going to flip the council. And now you've got a, a distracted and divided church. How's God going to fix this? Acts chapter 6 tells us that God stops the distraction by giving the church obedience. Acts, if you're looking at chapter 6, calls them the seven. Seven men. And what God does is he says to avoid distraction, he leads the church to appoint seven spirit-filled men to take care of of the daily needs of the church, the care of the widows. He gives the church these seven spirit-filled <coughs> men to keep 
keep the main work of the church clearly focused on the gospel. And, and this is the connection that we have to make. Y'all, I am deadly serious about this. What God did in giving the church these seven spirit-filled men, these what we have come to call deacons, what God did in this action in chapter 6 is no less important and no less impressive than what he did in the first two situations. So if you've ever wondered, why do we have deacons? We have deacons because God gave us deacons. God gave deacons as a gift to the work of the church. So we, we don't just have a tradition of having deacons serving in the church. What, what we need to say as a congregation is that we need deacons serving in the church because deacons were ordained by God to serve the church in a way that keeps the church on mission, on target. Deacons are charged with taking care of the church, keeping it strong, and guiding it through distraction. And you know, any church has got a thousand things that, that may come in as a question. Maybe we could do this. Maybe we ought to do that. I mean, can you imagine all of the things that are possible in the life of a church? And deacons are the ones who are charged with guiding the church through distraction, whether they be good distractions or bad distractions, to effectiveness. Well, after God gave the deacons to the church in Acts chapter 6, the Bible says they went to work. And I want you to see one verse. After the deacons went to work, in Acts chapter 6, verse 7, get a, another one of those summary statements from Luke. He says, so, so the deacons started taking care of stuff. And he says, and here's what happened. Now listen to this. And the word of God kept on spreading. And the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And even a great many of the priests, the Jewish priests, were becoming obedient to the faith. That's deacons at work. And we're going to ordain two new deacons today. Wow. 